thanks. This was this is really good. I'm glad we're we're getting the seminar series going, and I hope everybody uh, really starts thinking of good speakers to bring in for this because it it really will help um, get the word out of what we're doing here at the Planetary Human Health Institute. So I took a different tack. Uh, I don't think I've given a talk on carotenoids at all um, since I've joined the the PI. It's always been on on polyphenols. Uh, and normally when I give carotenoid talks, I spend a lot of time working on um, mechanisms of absorption over the years, preclinical and clinical models at the intestinal level, uh, with having learned from mentors, actually some of the same mentors that Karim had uh, at Ohio State and beyond. So I've, I've focused much of my attention on that. But the last, I'd say the last six, seven years, uh, we've been working more in the area of applying that. So I've, I've kind of turned a lot of my program on the carotenoid side, rather than being really mechanistic and looking at interactions to more applied aspects in terms of food supply and, of course, in, my, in this case, biofortification of crops and uh, vitamin A in particular. So it's going to be maybe not as, uh, not as mechanism heavy today, and it'll be a really lighter on the... On the on some of the science and, and more on the applied. But just to give you an idea of the groups that, that, our, that our group really liaises with, um, you know, here at NC State, we got myself and I finally moved uh, Howie DeBello, who just walked in. Where did she go? Oh, there she is, right in the front. Moved her from the Purdue side to the NC State side, although you're not officially hired yet. You gotta go open up the government first. Um, but. Oh, yeah. Most of my work in this area started at Purdue with, with really great collaborators, Gabisa Jetta and Bruce Hamaker, as well as Torbert Rochford. Uh, Gabisa being a um, geneticist and breeder of sorghum, one of the world's best, and Torbert being a geneticist, and don't call him a breeder, but he does that too, of biofortified maize. And then uh, Darwin Ortiz, who's his current postdoc, who was actually uh, my former grad student, and Bruce Hamaker, who's a very tight collaborator. But what you'll see here is a lot of the collaborations we've developed over the years in developing countries. Uh, University of Pretoria, Institute de Technologie Alimentaire in Senegal, University of Eldoret, uh, CIMIT, so for many of you that know uh, the breeding work on, on uh, maize and on wheat, um, INRAN in, in Niger, and then SEAT, the Center for Tropical Agriculture in Cali. Uh, and so what you'll see here, for example, is maize, um, cassava breeding, food processing and technology and grain processing. So a lot of expertise we work with around the, around the world and, and, and many of our projects. So what I'll talk about today is, is really the issue of addressing micronutrient uh, deficiencies, in, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa where it is, it is very, very prevalent. Uh, and in this case, vitamin A deficiency. We're 190 million or 33% of the school-aged children in Africa that are deficient, 19.1 million uh, pregnant women in this part of the world. So what you're, what you're really dealing with um, is absolute disaster type conditions. And in fact, in many ways, I think these, some of the more recent estimates will tell you these numbers are even worse than they really are. Um, ironically, this is in parallel to iron deficiency and zinc deficiency. Iron, which is really well mapped out and is probably the number one deficiency we deal with in the developing world. Zinc, ironically, we don't know the extent of zinc deficiency. Uh, very, very bad markers, uh, clinical markers for that right now, but it's estimated that that's probably going to be the one that's most impactful because it impacts stunting, for example, is a big one. But in any case, we work heavily on the vitamin A side. Karim, for example, works heavily on the vitamin A side, but Iron and zinc are always in the back of our minds, and in most cases, these deficiencies manifest one side the other, okay, because it's an issue of food availability. Um, so for vitamin A, you know, there's two ways of getting vitamin A. For those of you that, that have forgotten about vitamin A, you have preformed vitamin A or retinol. That's what you get from eating a lot of your fatty meats and, and, and stuff. as a fat-soluble vitamin stored in many of the adipose tissues uh, in these animals, uh, eggs. And then, of course, the majority of, uh, of the we'd say the pro-vitamin A are the carotenoids that we see in our brightly colored red, orange, and yellow fruits and vegetables. And if you think about the situation in sub-Saharan Africa, you're dealing with the majority of vitamin A not coming from animal sources, okay? It's coming from plant-based sources. So about uh, 88%, 78 to 88%. Um, and of course, what's the problem with that? Well, in many parts of the world where you're dealing with 
plant-based sources, plants are highly perishable. So you're dealing with massive amounts of post-harvest loss issues, which impact what? The availability of provitamin A carotenoids for these at-risk populations. It's very seasonal. And even then, within season, we're driving down the road in Senegal and you see mangoes just rotting everywhere. And all that vitamin A going to waste. It's a major, major problem. Almost four billion in lost uh, annually in cereal and 23 billion in post-harvest losses in fruits and vegetables. That's huge when you think about the amount that's uh, actually lost. Structurally, this is, have to have some chemical structures and I was just telling Penny, I do, I actually do, do check to make sure they're right because I've, I see this in talks around the country and I'm the guy who's counting the carbons. So I'm like, yeah, this is right. So the carotenoids and the provitamin A carotenoids start further up in the isoprenoid pathway, but eventually get to lycopene, which uh, those of you that work in watermelon and tomatoes know well, the red pigment. Uh, you can have lycopene cyclase uh, beta or gamma and you can, or uh, alpha and you, or the epsilon cyclase uh, to generate both alpha carotene and beta carotene. Main difference being the position of the double bond and extent of conjugation between these two. From that, perspect, from that point, then these carotenoids can be hydroxylated by different cytochromes and you can lead to xanthophils, uh, which are mono or dihydroxy, so lutein and zeaxanthin which are quite prevalent if you think about it in egg yolks and in maize um, and in other foods. But the only ones that have provitamin A activity are actually ones that have this beta inonone structure. So alpha carotene, beta carotene, and uh, beta cryptoxanthin, because you have one here, and alpha cryptoxanthin. Uh, huge debate on alpha cryptoxanthin because uh, it's very poorly studied. But really, you're dealing with only a subset of the carotenoids that can provide the provitamin A structure as it is cleaved symmetrically or asymmetrically into beta carotene here, two molecules of uh, retinol, which can then be esterified to retinal esters or retinol, retinol um, through reduction uh, to an aldehyde form. And these are the three main forms that you would see in the body, okay? So retinol being the active vitamin A form, retinal esters being the storage form. Uh, beta cryptoxanthin is only half of that. For example, alpha carotene only half because of the structure. Uh, so you're dealing, when you hear the term provitamin A carotenoids, a number that's not a quantitative number sometimes. It deals with the amount of beta carotene plus a fractional amount of the other provitamin A carotenoids based on their conversion potential. And that is a subject of hot debate. Still, I can't believe it, but it still is of, of, of the extent to which the body can convert some of these. There's data, for example, that beta cryptoxanthin is as efficient as beta carotene sometimes. Okay, so where are they in foods? Well, the, the pigment color will tell you a lot. So if you look at, for example, uh, lycopene, watermelon, uh, tomatoes, does anyone know what that is? I would give you a prize, but... No, it's GAC. GAC is from Vietnam. Uh, it's actually the single highest source of lycopene in any fruit. Um, never tasted it? Okay. Number one? No, I can't right off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I just know this one looks black when you extract it. It's pretty. So beta carotene, uh, carrots, sweet potatoes, which we know well, pumpkins, and then you'll hear a little bit about orange corn. Uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, which everybody talks about for eye health, so anything leafy green, yellow maize, um, peppers, orange peppers are a big source of zeaxanthin, okay? Anyone know what this is all the way down here? Wolfberry. Wolfberry, okay. You, you need to muzzle him. He's not allowed. He saw it because he had to eat this stuff. I think he was actually one of the participants. Chinese wolfberry, it's almost pure zeaxanthin ester. And so we use it um, as a, usually as a garnish on a lot of our experimental salads when we were doing a lot of uh, kinetic studies. And it was, um, they taste like dirt. The dried ones do. <laughs> the fresh ones are great. But anyhow, so what's the difference? Those foods are rich in carotenoids, but the problem is we rely on staple foods in many of the developing countries. So when you think about staple foods, you're, you're dealing with things like cereals, roots, and of course animal products, which would be great because many of them have vitamin A sources, but you're dealing with products the majority of the human population consumes. And in some cases, in some parts of this world, it's 90% of the calories. Well, what do you notice here? 
It's just not a lot of color, right? And they're usually made artisanally, if you will, in small groups, women's processor groups, but you're dealing with grains extensively and starchy products. Starch is the main energy source that we're dealing with in these populations, and, and, as, and as well for our population, still in the U.S., starch is, is the basis of our caloric, uh, our calorie density in our diet. So why does it, just give you a situation, an example of Niger. So in Niger, you know, you look at something like sorghum and millet, which are crops that now we talk a little bit about in the U.S., but sorghum primarily for animal feed, for, for cattle, and millet for birds, right? So if you get, a, if you get bird seed, you're going to get millet. But it's actually a significant part of the human food, and 80% almost of the diet, uh, percent of calories, is coming from these staples of sorghum and millet. And in Niger, it's primarily millet, okay? Primarily millet. A little bit of other grains, a little bit of rice, a little bit of maize, but it's primarily millet. Estimated consumption per person, 100 to 200 kilograms per year. Think about that, per person. So that's their, their primary source uh, of that. The problem is, if that's their primary source of calories, this is what you're dealing with. And this is maize, and this is white sorghum. And this is white cassava, which we'll talk about today. These countries that rely on these staples are dealing with things that are generally devoid of vitamin A. And most of the commercial genotypes that are grown are, in fact, vitamin A or carotenoid deficient. So you're dealing with, here's some levels of what you see in typical commercial genotypes of corn, white corn, which is the preference in Africa, less than one microgram per gram, millet, even less than that, sorghum, less than three, and cassava, less than one. These are the staple crops that people rely on in this part of the world, and they're just not getting vitamin A. So, you know, what's a solution to that? Well, if you're not going to get it from food, we can supplement you. This has been donor-dependent. It works great. You go in, you give people supplements, they get better. Then what happens when you go away? People become deficient again. You can fortify foods commercially. Works great if people have access to those foods. It also works great if people can pay for that because you're relying on materials and ingredients coming in from, the, from Europe, from the United States, from other parts of Asia into the developing world to do that, com that fortification commercially. And again, it helps a subset of the population. Well, diet diversity, we've talked about the challenges there. The main staple crops that are available, it's hard to diversify from that. So one of the proposals that was put forward is this area of can we put vitamin A into the staples that they currently eat? So that's what's known as biofortification. The real answer is it's probably a combination of all these. In some cases where you have massive amounts of clinical deficiency, you probably need to go in and supplement, get them out of that. You probably need to provide commercial fortified products in urban areas, places where people may have the ability and access to get them. It'd be great to diversify the diet, which means you have to diversify the agriculture in many of these countries, which is a challenge. Uh, and of course, biofortification can hit at different strata as well. Uh, but there are challenges with that for sure. So there are, of course, efforts underway. Harvest Plus is one of the organizations funded almost exclusively by Gates. As, an, as a leader in this area of biofortification, they've really looked at this as a sustainable approach because they think if they can get it from the growers up, then it would in fact begin to have effects. And they've targeted, for example, wheat, pearl millet, beans, cassava, maize, rice, sweet potato, and sorghum as some of their main crops. And again, this is an issue of developing nutrient-dense staple crops using a combination of conventional as well as transgenic or bio, modern biotech approaches. Harvest Plus focuses more on conventional breeding, which takes more time, although now it's certainly more efficient. But one of the things I want to point out is what they say at the end, which I'm not entirely sure is consistent with what they do. Uh, they don't want to sacrifice agronomic performance, and they, do, and they want to include important consumer preferred traits, taste, color, performance, and products. This is so low on their totem pole that it's a challenge, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that. So, you know, they do use multiple approaches from transgenics to, to breeding and, and, of course, even agronomic approaches. There's even some, for example, some, some trials underway right now, in, in, um, actually it's in Ethiopia, using zinc in the fertilizer blend as a way to enhance zinc in, uh, in, in, pro, in a QPM, or a quality protein maize. So there's, there's multiple approaches that can be used, and 
and so they've also have established targets. If you remember where we were like at around the one microgram per level, they're targeting uh, 15 micrograms for, for example, orange maize, cassava, and sorghum, 15 to 20. Now, we'll talk today about the transgenic sorghum, which is Pioneer's um, stuff that we've worked with. Uh, it's a little different, and, uh, but the target's a little bit higher, and hopefully you'll see why uh, in a second. But again, those are the targets. They've also, I'll just point out, you can go look at progress on this, and maybe this is um, a little, little hope that you're starting to see released lines of biofortified products as well as testing going on in many parts of the world. But this is a Harvest Plus map that they have and they update fairly routinely so you can see where things are. Um, just to give you an idea, again, it's hard to see. I have a lot of eye charts on this pr presentation. Um, so what are the important things to consider as you move from breeding or genetic approaches to getting it into the food supply? So, okay, we have to set the targets and we have to decide how we're gonna fortify biofortification. Then you have to think about trials in the field, worry about both pre-harvest and post-harvest levels of the target nutrients, iron, zinc, or, vitamin, or provitamin A. Then what happens over storage? So people have to harvest it, they have to dry it, they have to use it. Uh, of course, there's the food processing piece, and it's gotta be converted either industrially or in the home. There is consumption, so now what happens after you consume it, how much of it's absorbed? So it's great if I put in a million units of whatever here, but if the absorption is really low, what's the point? Um, and then of course, utilization. The other thing about consumption is people have to prefer it. They're not gonna buy it if they don't prefer it. Um, no matter what populations you deal with, consumer preferences matter. So if you think about who that impacts, farmers, wholesalers, and processors, it impacts processors and consumers, and of course the consumer at the end. So we, we actually deal with a lot of this front side, which is for the largest part of my career, I dealt with this part, the process, absorption, and utilization. I'm now finding myself dealing more with this actual earlier stages, which is kind of interesting. So the temptation though, when you talk to geneticists and breeders is to go, well, if I just put enough in, it'll be fine. Right? So I go from there right to the last three steps. I can make a biofortified crop, I'll feed it to people, and it'll, it'll take care of everything, no matter if they don't like it or not. That's okay. Um, and if you actually look, and again, sorry, I didn't realize it was going to be <laughs> this hard to see. This is actually from Howdy Boys, who uh, was the head of Harvest Plus. And if you look at their roadmap, this is their roadmap. They talk about targeting, uh, setting nutritional targets for breeding, and then it goes bioavailability, compositional characteristics, human efficacy studies. All the way down here, you have market and product development. So only after they've decided what they're gonna make do they start messing around with, can it get into the food supply? So there's, there's not a lot of emphasis. Acceptability pro, uh, from producers and consumers is after they've established that this stuff works clinically, where it might need to be done in parallel, or maybe you need to understand more about what the consumers want. So there are some challenges. This has been the temptation. And so what are some key factors that we've been involved in in targeting this? So one is we've actually stepped back and started addressing some of those before the bioavailability piece. Agronomic and environmental. You hear this a lot in the genetics world and in the breeding world, G by E. So we're, we have been working with farmers looking at the evolution of provitamin A pre-harvest, understanding what agronomic practices that can, infect, can affect the, the synthesis of that in the biofortified grains. A newer one is G by P, the, the, the right genetics for the right process. Okay, so I'll give you an example of that with cassava at the end. And then there's the consumer in the market, right? That's one that we're definitely dealing with on the ground in Africa is can you, do you want this type of product? And if so, how? Um, and so I'll give some examples of each of those. But just to start out, some early work. So I got into this, I was at Purdue about a year. I think I had just hired a young Andrew Nielsen as a, po as a graduate student. Yes. <laughs> Andrew, what do you want to work on? I'm not working on sorghum, no. Um, but um, I, worked, I had a meeting with um, a gentleman who eventually won the World Food Prize, so Gabisa Ejeta. Uh, and Gabisa had come to me and said, I hear that you work on carotenoids. I'm very interested because sorghum is typically quite white. This is white sorghum. Not a pigment to be seen in that. But he goes, I have some traditional lines from parts of Africa that are yellow endosperm. 
and I'd like to characterize them for carotenoids. And so he had some, he grew them up. In fact, before that, he gave us some seeds from breeding, uh, initial screening, about 30 breeding lines. And we saw really a lot of lutein and zeaxanthin, not much in terms of beta carotene. And if you looked at what we screened over a three year period, just from bat, some stuff he had in storage, really, really low levels. Uh, 0.1 to 0.3 uh, per kilogram of, uh, of total carotenoids. Provitamin A as high as 0.5 in some cases. Sorry, that should be 0.05, not 5. Um, and then in 2008, we said, well, let's do one where we catch it fresh. And in fact, we saw that we could get levels as high as 3, 3.5 and milligrams. So maybe it's not that it's not there. It's there, but it degrades rapidly after storage of the grain through the chain. So he said, okay, so let's, let's do a study where we actually follow this pre-harvest. And so we would follow, for example, these are days after half bloom. So in sorghum after half bloom, you start looking at maturation days and right around 40 days is, 40 to 50 days is considered to be about full maturity of the sorghum grain. And what you're seeing is carotenoids peaking at about 30 days after half bloom. And then as the starch synthesis, it's a grain, so as the starch synthesis kicks in, the carotenoids are diluted in the grain. We express this in thousand kernels, so to take care of uh, size issues of the grain. You normalize it by number of kernels. And then when you break this down from total carotenoids, again, you see a lot of lutein and zeaxanthin. Uh, beta carotene is the orange one here. The colors didn't come out, but very low. So not a whole lot of provitamin A in there, but anyhow, you know, you could see that there's a peak early on, 30, and then it drops. Now, what's interesting is Gabisa told me it's interesting that it peaks like that. Uh, one is zeaxanthin gets broken down into abscisic acid, which is needed for seed dormancy. But the other thing is, depending on the food situation in certain countries, they'll harvest early because they need the food. And there could be opportunities to harvest early and get vitamin A if you can get the right profiles in there. So we said, okay, well, let's see, even though there's not a lot there, if, it's a, if it can take it, make a food, traditional food with it, and if it's absorbable. So we formulated a very traditional African porridge, but we made one mistake. We took the right amount of sorghum ground up meal, we put the right amount of water, slurried it, and then we boiled it with more water and you make a porridge, very traditional porridge. So if you like grits, that's what this looks like. It's just sorghum. Uh, but we actually cooked it with a gram of, of oil. Uh, and we did that because we need lipid for absorption of carotenoids. And so we, we made these porridges, had very similar levels uh, between two different, two different lines. So P1222 uh, and P88, which were both, one is actually a, a Kenyan, uh, not Kenyan, Nigerian line, and one is a, a line from Thailand. Um, and they both are promising. And we compared it to just the yellow dent maize. So Bex 5856, which I don't even think exists anymore. And what's interesting is then we started measuring how much could be absorbed from that type of porridge. And just to give you a quick overview of that, carotenoids, the lipid inclusion is important because the steps for absorption of fat solubles involves the carotenoids being released from digestion, breakdown of the food, and the fat being digested, and the digestion products of the fat, the mono and diglycerides, and the carotenoids actually get solubilized in bile salt lipid micelles. So carotenoid absorption is tied to fat absorption. No fat, no carotenoid absorption, okay? And then following uptake into the intestine, uh, you have packaging in the chylomicron, and that is also dependent on availability of lipid, okay? So the type and amount of lipid are very important. We spent 10 years investigating these stages of absorption, Karim can tell you. <laughs> so we, were, we already knew, uh, and this secretion in the chylomicron can be followed uh, kinetically, and you can do all sorts of nice studies. But what's really interesting is this first part, this what we call the preabsorptive part, this transfer from the food to the micelle, is actually the bioaccessibility. It's very dependent on the food matrix, the digestion of the lipid, the digestion of the food matrix, and it has a very high correlation to ultimately blood levels and absorption. That one step, it doesn't mean that you can't have other factors, but that one step is predictive, very predictive. In fact, Rubol, uh, Patrick uh, Burrell's group in France I think the correlation is for, for the carotenoids, beta carotene and lycopene, it's like 0.94 between uh, measuring this in an in vitro paradigm and in fact 
the in vivo situation. So how that. How do, you, how do you decide how much lipid needs to go into a serving cereal? So that was like a whole 10 years worth oh. of. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, actually, you do dose response studies. Okay. And you have to match the carotenoid profile and content to a right type of lipid. So the simple answer is between three and six grams of lipid, primarily of monounsaturated basis, because it's, it both enhances micelle formation, but also stimulates chylomicron synthesis. So that was two huge USDA grants and an NIH grant, and that's what made me want to do this. Three, six grams of lipid per how much? Per standard meal size, so 100, 200 grams of food. Probably in that five to 15 milligrams of carotenoids. Now there's, the more lipid you put in there, the more you're gonna absorb, but the, then it becomes diminishing returns, right? So then you're like, well, the caloric density is a problem. So anyhow, how do you measure the bioaccessibility where there's a very clean model that was de uh, developed uh, by a gentleman named Mark Faela actually at UNC Greensboro. And I would come down and work with Mark when he was at Greensboro before we hired him at Ohio State. So then he was on my committee. I think he was on your committee too, right? So, <laughs> But this model was designed very simply as a gastric and intestinal model to digest the food and expose them to those conditions and then measure the transfer to bile salt lipid micelles. Uh, what was done to make it more conducive to cereals, inclusion of amylase in an oral phase, because a lot of starch, if you digest the uh, starchy food, you get glue. So you need this oral phase, uh, then go to gastric, small intestinal, and then you can isolate the lipid micelles through this. Now, for those of you that have been up to the lab on the fourth floor, we, this used to be a one test tube at a time model. We're now doing it the, this, the, the front row over here is doing it in like 30 to, 30 to 80 at a time uh, and losing sleep over it. But, uh, but in any case, uh, it's become far more efficient. What you can do then is measure how many of the carotenoids are transferred to this aqueous fraction, so solubilizing the aqueous environment, dividing it by how much is actually released total or how much is in the food, and you get what we call a micellarization efficiency. And that efficiency is what's correlated to the bioavailability in vivo. So what does it look like? Well, out of these maize, not maize, sorghum porridges, it was actually quite high. Um, if you look here, you're dealing with beta crypt, alpha cryptoxanthin, beta cryptoxanthin. These are the provitamin A carotenoids. You're dealing with very high levels. And we were dealing with whole grain and decorticated. And you could see, in fact, 50, 60 percent bioaccessible between the two varieties. Maize, on the other hand, was a bit lower. So corn was sitting at around 40, in some cases, 30-something percent bioaccessible. So the sorghum was more bioaccessible than the corn. But uh, because the levels were so low, the total amount that was actually available was still pretty poor. You're only dealing with a couple hundred, maybe 100 micrograms per kilo of wet cooked porridge. So what are you dealing with? Only about 1 or 2% of the uh, estimated adequate uh, levels that you need of the EAR which is a number that targets 50% of the population. So that's pretty poor. So that means, yeah, there's room to move. These, these sorghum varieties may be good places to start, but there's room to move. Um, so right about that same time, we got involved with an ABS project. This is the Africa Biofortified Sorghum Project. So anyone done a grand challenge? So these are, these are those big multi-million dollars. So this was grand challenge nine, create a full range of optimal bioavailable nutrients in a single staple plant species. And this was 2006. And they targeted cassava, banana, rice, uh, and sorghum, nutritionally enhanced sorghum for arid and semi-arid tropical areas. Pioneer, so DuPont Pioneer, CSIRO Pretoria, and uh, a foundation, Africa Harvest Biotech, um, which I, mom told me not to say anything bad, so I'll leave it at that. But in any case, um, they were successful in generating some biofortified sorghum varieties. And here, as you can see, for example, here's actually a biofortified sorghum versus the wild type. You see a yellow golden, golden sorghum, if you will. Their problem was they had no idea if it was absorbable. And so we became involved with Pioneer at that time. They brought us into the project. I can tell you the longer story about how we were not part of the original project, even though we were. Um, but what they actually did is took a lot of genes from E. coli and a couple, and a um, few other bacterial species and also even Arabidopsis and included them in different pathways to upregulate the pathways uh, of carotenoid synthesis and actually 
generated several events um, that are in fact very high in beta carotene. And high enough, for example, again there's your eye chart, but really these four are the ones that are probably most interesting, that we're dealing with almost five to 20 fold higher than what we were seeing before. So we were very excited. So they didn't just upregulate the carotenoid genes, they also upregulated storage protein genes, cafferins and other storage protein genes in these to try to catch the carotenoids as well. And we got very excited about this, but then they came to us. And what did I tell you about the breeders? Oh yeah, we're ready to go to clinical trials. They had not even thought about screening whether or not this stuff is, is good. They used a high digestibility line as a background, so they said that must be fine. Well, we put it, made the porridges, put it through the same models, and what did we find? So starting provitamin A content, here's your transgenic null. Theirs is, was actually higher than ours, so it tells you that they also picked something that, that we didn't find in our short screening. These were the events, if you look at the provitamin A content, about 7, 8, and, and almost 6, with ranges all the way up to 12 and 14. After you make a porridge, you're generating porridges with you know, 144 micrograms per 100 grams of fresh weight versus 25. So that tells you, that's a big jump. And now, just to give you an idea, people consume up to 300 grams of wet cooked porridges at a time in some parts of Africa, so that's a lot. Our micellarization efficiency was interesting. The null was about 8.2, ranging up to 11. So it was higher, but not as high as what we had seen before. Look how low the biofortified ones were. 2, 3.3, 2.9. Um, so great, you jacked it up, but then it became far less bioavailable. So at the very end, you're delivering, in some cases, less than the null. So they did have one, ABS-188, which was somewhat promising, and it could get us about 15 to 24% of the EAR. But they had been working on this for five years, and I had to go back and tell them the news. Yeah, it's not that great. So they didn't speak to me for about three years. Um, and they went off and did an animal study which confirmed a lot of what we had seen. And then they had other lines that were made that were better. And actually now we're speaking to them again, so we're doing some work with them now uh, on this. But stepping back is important as well. So they could have also looked at are there other factors that we think we know why it was low. We think that a lot of this beta carotene was crystalline in the sorghum. And we think processing may help you get out of that and make it more available. So just wet cooking it as a porridge may not be the best approach for that one. So stepping back and looking at kind of the first parts are really where a lot of our work has gone. And at that point, since we were persona non grata on the sorghum side, we turned our attention to working with a gentleman named Torbert Rochford, who we hired from Illinois, um, right about the time where I was transitioning from sorghum to maize. And Torbert, uh, as you see, he has his own orange maize brand. Uh, look how bright orange that, that stuff is. And if you come into my office, I'll show you some, and it's all degraded. But we actually started looking at some of his traditional breeding lines. He had, he had different ones with different pedigrees. Um, this orange ISO, this is uh, one, is one that's a very, very high priority. This, this is basically one that has moved forward in Zambia and other parts of, of Africa as well, and one that we included. He also had some other ones that he was interested in. So we said, okay, why don't we start going back through the value chain of maize and understanding uh, different levels? So first of all, just characterizing carotenoid content. There's not a whole lot to talk about here other than we were seeing levels very similar to what other breeders and geneticists had seen, 66 micrograms per gram, so far higher than what we were seeing in the sorghum side. For total, the beta carotene levels are very close to those targets if you're a member of 15 that we talked about, so they're getting very close uh, in that 13 range. But lutein and zeaxanthin are the primary carotenoids there. So there's always a balance of pushing the carotenes to xanthophyll pathways and trying to put the brakes on after the carotenes to kind of slow down that conversion. But there are some, in fact, that then there's lutein and zeaxanthin, which are alpha and beta carotene dihydroxy forms. There's a shift between alpha and beta carotene lines, and there's also beta cryptoxanthin. There's one that's very high in beta cryptoxanthin, which is provitamin A, but only half, but there's actually very good data to suggest that this one is far more bioavailable. So there's, he wanted a spread of different profiles to look at. So what's the first thing we did? Well, if you've ever been on a farm, corn is harvested, it's dried, right? So it has to be dried. 
and then it has to be stored. And in some cases, the loss in Africa is massive. This stuff gets stored, it gets moldy, you, you have a lot of high moisture. Drying and storage of grain in Africa is probably one of the largest problems. So we said, well, let's understand the storage rates of decay and map it for people so that we can get kinetic maps for people to predict losses in country. So we selected those six. We took three temperatures because you need at least three to, to get some Arrhenius type behaviors. We did three different water activities to get different relative humidities. So for arid areas versus tropical areas. And we used different saturated salt solutions to do this. And then we actually followed this for a year. So you can imagine the amount of time. And we did this in mason jars, um, saturated salt solutions in the bottom, mucilin bags holding this. We were not everybody's friend in the building because we had taken over lots of different incubation uh, chambers and rooms. But there's your, another eye chart for you. And, I, and no, I'm not that worried about going through every one of these. We just wanted to show you we were following kinetically the losses in these carotenoids over time. And the really take home here is the first three months, you're already losing 40% of the provitamin A. By one year, you've lost 80%. Now, in Africa, you're dealing with about three to six months of storage. So if they're not eating it early, they're going to lose a lot of that value. So there's a, now the question is, it's not enough to breed more. Can you breed more stable? Right? So that's a, a target for them now. And we've actually identified a, a certain number in, in doing analysis. Genotype was a factor here. So we're trying to give them, even only on six varieties, some information on the stability of these across those six. And in fact, what we found is that all the carotenoids degrade somewhat similarly. The carotene's more so than, than the xanthophils. But the genotype showed a significant difference. Um, and genotype three, which is this cross between two um, C17 and D3, C17 being a Thailand, from Thailand, high beta carotene one, had the highest, which is found to have the highest rate of degradation, right? Two times greater than those of other genotypes. Yet, genotype six was not significant, statistically lower, but trending that way. So basically saying, look, we're trying to see if we can find the right triggers there. And now, what that would mean is screening more. But you could imagine doing stability screening over 100 if not the thousands of, of these that we have. So it's a resource issue, but at least getting some information. But why was genotype three worse? So what is easier to screen than stability long-term? Kernel physical properties, right? So it sounds a lot like Massimo screening size when you ask about why they're doing all the quality attributes on berries, same thing here. So what we found that was interesting is genotype three is more oblong, less dense. It's a dent corn as opposed to a flinty corn. I'll talk about what that means in a second. But the length of the kernel was longer, and the porosity was greater. So more air exchange with the kernel, more degradation. Why? Well, it's a dent corn versus a flinty corn. And the difference there, flinty corn tends to have a harder end, uh, outer endosperm. This is what they call the horny endosperm. And in fact, it's glassy, if you will, like that. So here's a biofortified uh, maize flinty type. The flinty corns are preferred in Africa for several reasons in terms of textural properties, but they tend to be high amylopectin. They're very, very um, crystalline in nature, harder and denser than the dent corns that you typically see grown in the US. This is a temperate corn, this is a tropical corn. So again, why would we ever breed on a temperate maize then? So again, focus on this type of, type of kernel as one that is going to be better. So moving from there, what type of products? Now let's go down the value chain. Well, you can just mill these grains. You can pre-cook them and sell them that way as instant products. I think many of you probably had instant grits, right? Big product. And then fermentation. So those were three that we followed extensively in our time. So dry milling of maize, I don't want to go into a lot of this, but it's basically grinding and size separation. And at the very end, if you go, whether you're in Africa or here, you're dealing with different types of ground maize. If you go to the grocery store, you can buy grits, right? You can buy a snack meal, and you can buy flowers. And it's really all about particle size, less than one millimeter and then above, right? So you're dealing with coarse to fine. So the question is, how stable are the carotenoids after they're ground? Is there a way through the grinding to stabilize, or does it get worse? What we actually found is that, first of all, if you refine it, take away the germ, since most of the carotenoids are in the endosperm, you don't lose a lot. 
It's about 10% loss when you just decorticate, take out the germ, take off the brand, and you're dealing with, in fact, just the endosperm, where all the carotenoids primarily are in corn. This is important because in wheat and other grains, the carotenoids accumulate throughout. But in corn, you're dealing with primarily in the flowery and horny endosperm. So, very quickly, stability, we did a similar stability study with the milled fractions. And so I just want to point a couple things out. Dent type versus flinty types, for total carotenoids, we didn't see a big difference in the degradation. They all look about the same. We only looked at three different genotypes here. Xanthophyll content, and then now what do you see, though? Provitamin A. So in the provitamin A content, dropped far more dramatically in the dent type milled products than in the flint type. So it's not just an issue of the kernel structure. There could be something else related to protein content and other factors that say temperate mazes tend to have less stability, uh, even in their milled products. Um, yeah, flint type is more stable. Anyhow, okay, great. We know something about that to feed back. How about cooking and extrusion in this case? So extrusion is a way we generate processed products. So anyone seen an extruder work? Anybody made an animal diet before? <laughs> Anybody seen PVC pipe being made? It's the same thing. It's how you think of it from the standpoint of like how cereals are made. If you take, you make a dough, if you will, you put in at the front of a screw with high pressure, it gelatinizes the starch and cooks the starch as under pressure and temperature, and on the outside pops out a fully cooked product. In this case, you can see the corn melt through a double extruder. This is a single screw extruder that we use in, in Africa for grains. Uh, it does about 30 kg an hour, and what looks like this Laffy Taffy coming out the other side is actually something that once dried grinds into instant grits. That's how you make instant grits. So fully cooked. All you got to do is put hot water and it's fully cooked. Um, so the question is, since you're dealing with extremes in temperature and pressure and moisture contents going in, what is the recovery of carotenoids through that? Very quickly. Um, total carotenoid content, we did different moistures. Screw speed, because that's the only way we can control temperature and pressures. Um, and you could actually look at the retention here and see that for the most part, we had pretty decent retention until we got to some extreme conditions of, of moisture and, and speed. But 60 to 80 to even 94% recovery through that process. Carotenoids are pretty heat stable. Okay, a lot of people don't think that, but they are. And what was kind of interesting is we could find an optimum of lower screw speeds and higher moisture, we could get higher recoveries, which is kind of what we provide as information to processors uh, there. And again, that's just kind of one of those interesting quirks of screening these types of products for people that need to make them commercially. So the last type of product we did the shakedown for biofortified maize is one on fermentation. So another very traditional process people do in the home and commercially is fermenting. So uji, which is a, very, is a very sour fermented porridge out of maize. You'll see this in cassava as well and, and others. It's very common in East Africa. And it, you see that very, very glassy appearance, very acidic. This thing will peel the inside of your mouth off if you eat it straight. They have to highly sweeten this stuff. Uh, we actually set up a pilot little uh, fermenter to do some closed fermentations, controlled storage conditions, five genotypes, we did uh, different fermentation times up to 120 hours. Oops. And uh, about 100 grams at a time. And then we even used the fermentation water to close the loop on this. And when we, we basically took this and made ultimately a flour, uh, that would be, in theory, now ready to be sold. Um, what we found is that the carotenoids were quite stable up to 72 hours, and then stability fell off. And now, when we presented some of this work originally, some of the folks from um, the U.S. were like, well, who would ferment it for 120 hours? And then we're talking to the folks in Africa. They're like, we, we let it sit there for weeks sometimes, much less hours. So the concern is on these highly fermented products is complete loss of carotenoids, whereas you can actually get fermentation in 72 hours, and I don't, I'm not going to show you the data, but you get very good textural quality up to 72 hours building a viscosity. So you can cut the fermentation time shorter.
uh, and do that. So long steeping periods, not a good idea. All right. Um, the stability during then cooking of that fermentation, what we found is, again, the provitamin A carotenoids had the least amount of stability. So we still have more to do there. If you're losing 70% after cooking the fermented product, why is it so much more labile now than it was through extrusion? Well, think about what you're doing through fermentation. You're also releasing minerals, iron, zinc, other minerals, divalent minerals that can induce oxidation. And now once you put heat into the system, you begin to induce reactivity of the carotenoids, whereas through extrusion, you don't see that same release. So this is an example of the type of products you probably don't want biofortified maize going into, uh, even though they're, they're a staple. Uh, we then took it one step further. Well, how about from zero to 120 hours, what's the stability through digestion? If we lost stability in cooking, you could see that the more we fermented, the lower the stability, the stability, not yet bioaccessibility through digestion. So all that release of minerals, in fact, furthered the oxidative process post-consumption. So this was through our in vitro digestion model. So again, unfermented, you're pretty stable, actually, over 100% because you became more efficient at extracting. But the minute you started fermenting, went down. That's total carotenoids. There's lutein. There's zeaxanthin. There's beta carotene. All follow similar trends. Um, big problem when you're losing that much. So well, how much of it's actually micellarized? This was actually quite interesting. Very little. Very little micellarization. 1% to 2%. And in fact, unfermented versus fermented, you begin to see a couple of genotypes, these orange isos, which are the ones that, again, Torbert is most interested in, but it's all, the minute it's fermented, it's dropping. So we have an issue not only of stability, but then of also myself. I actually thought Darwin had done this wrong. I made him redo it multiple times. Still not 100% confident that we got it, but this, this type of process really screws up a lot of things. And so, you know, a lot of differences between uh, time and genotypes. So one of the interesting thing is, well, then how do you get biofortified maize in? You don't build viscosity, you don't have these things. So part of it is actually beyond stability. The practical challenge is orange maize doesn't build viscosity. So consumers, for example, this is peak viscosity of orange maize, 100% orange maize versus white maize. It's like half. So that means people would want to use twice as much maize, which is great for vitamin A, but guess what? They're not going to want to buy it because they have to use more of it. So we were looking at examples of, well, can we blend it with white maize to generate the right viscosities as well? And might that also help the stability? These are ongoing studies we're doing. A student named Smith Nakata from Malawi is doing this. His, he actually screened this by accident and found out, hey, we got major problems anyway. No one's going to want to buy this because it doesn't build viscosity, much less ferment right. So again, breeders not talking to food people. Big problem. OK, I know we're running out of time. But um, quickly, I want to give you a quick demonstration of even a more interesting piece of where genetics and processing can match. So cassava, um, much like maize and sorghum, is a major, major staple crop. So 16th. Um, it, it's in West Africa, probably even more important uh, in this case. So the cassava, you know, people eat the leaves and the roots, but primarily we're talking about the roots that I'm most interested in. And you see it um, in fermented porridges, different types of products uh, all over the world. Um, you're probably as familiar with it with tapioca pudding here in the U.S. Also has a lot of industrial uses. And then, of course, animal feeds, but it's a very, very, very major crop. And cassava itself is also carotenoid free. But SEAT has a breeding program where they have, I think it's about 600 different lines, breeding lines now, uh, that they work with that they've received uh, good feedback on carotenoid levels. Big issue with cassava is cyanogen levels. So they're, they're working on getting the carotenoids high in the lower cyanogen lines. They had yet to actually go through the same process we went with maize. So we had another student, uh, Ingrid Aragon, who is actually Darwin Ortiz's wife. That's an interesting thing, husband and wife in the same lab, um, who actually did this work. And we sent her down to Columbia to do much of the processing there. 
Now, cassava is interesting because you actually have, you have to get rid of the cyanogens. That means you actually have to ferment it or other ways of getting rid of cyanogens. So with our concern about fermentation, this became a problem, right? Well, what's going to happen? So we did a, a series of, of processing experiments, peeling, washing, grating it, drying it directly, milling it into an unfermented flour versus fermented flour fermentations, including a toasted fermented flour, which is known as gadi in parts of West Africa. Um, just show you really quickly some of the results there. So the beta carotene equivalents, okay, this is the sum of beta carotene equivalents across those genotypes that we looked at. What do you notice? The general trend is the same. You could start out with more, you end up with more. You see for generally between raw fermentation, oven drying and cooking, you see, you know, retention that's all the way up to about 67, 36 to 67 percent, as low as 6 to 52 percent. So there are some that are better than others. Um, this is the non-fermented, so what we see here, in fact, is, is similar, but in some cases even, you know, the oven drying itself creates a problem, so it's not so much the fermentation. But there wasn't a big difference genotype to genotype. This is where it got interesting. We pushed it through our in vitro digestion model. These are fermented, is orange, unfermented. Took the same flowers, fermented or unfermented, and passed them through the ones, and beta carotene bioaccessibility. So what do you see here? Across all these genotypes, you have a set that if you ferment them, the bioaccessibility goes up. You have a set that if you ferment them, the bioaccessibility goes down. Then you have a set in the middle that's unaffected. So this was the first time that I think we really documented across, again, it's not that many genotypes, but there's a G by P potential interaction here. It'd be great to be able to do hundreds of these to be able to map out what's happening. Um, but really shine the light on the fact that this was somewhat interesting in terms of uh, impact, because now you can guide people. For fermented versions, use this. For low cyanogen, unfermented versions, use that. So we've since expanded from just strictly looking at the biofortified crops into getting them into food systems. And many of the countries we work in, in West Africa or in East Africa, primarily our activities are funded by USAID through two innovation labs. One is the Food Process Innovation Lab that's how's that Purdue. The other one is the Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab. And ironically, we don't do a whole lot of work with biofortification in these two outside of using them as raw materials, right? We're not, we're not doing basic work on biofortification, uh, the exception of millet. But what's interesting is we have some goals to go market ready now. So we've been five years into these projects. They've both just recently been renewed. The FPL for three years and the Sorghum Millet Innovation Lab at Kansas State was renewed for five and our project will be renewed within that. So we'll be at this for another five years, trying to now get it into the market. And part of the struggles that you have there is not so much just trying to get biofortified grains into the market or staples, it's using those cereal products as staples as carriers of nutrition. So this is what Howie's project, for example, was, which is taking sorghum or millet or whatever and transforming it into products, couscous. These are agglomerated products that are products that are normally made by hand, but now we can make industrially. And then you can formulate with either biofortified grains or with other nutrient-dense plants. So what we've been doing over the past uh, four years in part of Howie's project was identifying and characterizing nutrient-dense plants that can be synergistic with the cereal background, bring more nutrients in. So we've looked at things like baobab, which is high in vitamin C, high in phenolics, things like moringa, high in vitamin A, high in protein, for example, as complementary uh, components to these cereals, whether they be biofortified or not, to provide provitamin A sources and mineral sources. Now remember what I talked about synergies between too many minerals may be, create problems for vitamin A. So we have to map all those synergies, positive and negatives, out. And so that's what Howie basically did her entire PhD on. So how does some of this stuff look? This is an extruder. This is former student now, Shekin Dai from uh, Senegal, who's extruding here at Purdue. And you get, look at the color of that. Um, whole grain millet, carrot and baobab co-extruded, uh, or a uh, extruded blend. Again, using 35% moisture because we defined those conditions from maize, validated them with these. And you can make products that in fact have high provitamin A, 
agglomerated products of thicker characteristics. These are all instant. Now, why is that important for Africa? Time, right? Women are the primary people who work and cook and do everything. It takes them hours to make traditional porridges. It takes them minutes using the instant product. If you can put them into the market, they will pref they, there's evidence of them preferring it based on the fact that it saves them time. It's also a sanitation issue. These are pasteurized products now. So we, we're very interested in developing and launching these. In fact, you can get several different varieties. We're finding quality traits. Baobab is lightening the color of whole grain. That's another new thing. In West Africa, whole grain is not consumed because of the color. Uh, in East Africa, it's preferred. Uh, so how do you make whole grain look like refined grain? You, you take baobab or acidify it, and it actually lightens the color. So we're actually looking at commercialization. We're working with local partners. This is, um, this is a group that we work with in Tuba, Senegal, which is their holy city of West Africa. Pretty interesting group. Bruce Hamaker and, and others there that we go work, we're doing in here actually consumer tests. Okay, so we're doing sensory and consumer work, trying to map out profiles. And we actually had um, some evidence that these types of approaches work. Um, basically looking at fortified in instant products, traditionally fortified or using local materials have equal parity in terms of willingness to pay. This is West African francs. The product D&E are actually the fortified products either with a mineral pre vitamin mineral premix or our natural ones and are actually at parity in terms of willingness to pay, which means that consumers are seeing these as equivalent products. Um, and in fact, that's an area we're moving on quite significantly. So I'll end there. Uh, so despite a lot of progress on the genetics and breeding side, there's a long way to go before they get to consumers. Um, it's time, you're seeing a lot of this work now. Breeding and biotechnology really helping us hit targets. Validation throughout the chain is ongoing. This is one that I think we're talking about a lot here at the Pi, is how do you piece together the food processing part on the genetics? Is there a G by P area we can explore across lots of different things? A new pilot plant's an opportunity for that. Um, and the higher throughput screening of stability and bioaccessibility will be a part of that. So now, in many ways, is that time to focus on product streams as we identify, select, what we would say elite or priority genotypes. So hopefully the next three to five years, we'll actually have commercial stuff with partners on the market in Africa to talk about. So, and Howie will be the one going back and forth to do that because I'm tired of traveling. Um, just, yeah, acknowledgements, wanted to point out group that we work with at Pioneer, uh, Mark Albertson, who was actually the PI from the Pioneer side and uh, Zuan uh, Zhao, who I still work with, actually, a little bit. John Taylor and, and Andrea Lofse, who actually got me back in to good graces with Pioneer. So, um, and of course, the grad students had a list of, uh, so um, Ellie George Keene, who actually went to school with, with Andrew, uh, did a lot of the original work on sorghum, and Tristan Lipke, uh, who's now at Cargill, and believe it or not, worked for Bill Amutis, who wouldn't let him go from Cargill when I was trying to get him to apply for our chemistry <laughs> position. Um, but Darwin and Ingrid is still at Purdue, Shellen Goltz, uh, who did a lot of the fundamental bioavailability work that you didn't even see, but drove us into the lipid side of the formulations. And good funding we've had from ARS, uh, NIFA, and then of course Bill Melinda Gates and USAID. So I'll stop there, and I know I've gone longer than I should have. But.